Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Suggett, and I'd like to welcome you to the Canadian Digestive Health Foundation's webinar series. Um, as the official foundation of the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology, CDHF is directly connected to Canada's leading digestive health experts, physicians, scientists, and other healthcare professionals. So you can trust us to provide you with practical science-based information that is up-to-date and unbiased. Irritable bowel syndrome affects between 10 to 15% of people in the developed world about one-third of whom have IBS with diarrhea as the primary symptom, commonly referred to IBSD. This is our topic of our webinar this evening, which is being made possible through an unrestricted educational grant from Allergan Canada. Our presenter this evening is Dr. Steve Vanner, the Director, Gastrointestinal Disease Research Unit and Professor of Medicine at Queen's University. During Dr. Vanner's presentation, if any questions come to mind, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and enter your question in the box that appears. Questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. So with, without further ado, uh, welcome Dr. Vanner. Thank you very much, Jeff, and good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, be able to present this webinar on the irritable bowel syndrome. This is going to be a good news story. Uh, we've known about irritable bowel syndrome now for over 150 years, and it uh, really starts to feel like we're beginning to understand uh, uh, some of the causes, at least, of this disorder. And also, we've got some of therapies that are now emerging that appear to be uh, helpful for many of our patients. So uh, this evening, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what is the irritable bowel syndrome, uh, what are the symptoms of diarrhea predominant IBS, or as we commonly refer to it as IBSD? What causes IBSD? What are some of the current uh, and exciting new areas? How do we diagnose IBSD? And then a little bit about treating IBSD as well. And then, as Jeff has mentioned, we'd like to end then with a question and answer period and, and uh, certainly would welcome your questions. So irritable bowel syndrome uh, has many different faces, but it's really a symptom-defined disorder by physicians. It's characterized by abdominal pain plus altered bowel pattern. And this altered bowel pattern can have different forms. It can be as shown on the left uh, by this uh, well-known movie star with constipation, uh, uh, can have diarrhea and it can affect across uh, a large swath of our society, including famous politicians. Uh, it can alternate between constipation and diarrhea. And in some patients, uh, it appears very precipitously uh, after an acute infection. So for example, if someone were to get a salmonella infection in their colon, this infection would resolve, but they might be left with uh, the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome, which surprisingly can persist for years. And then we've recognized the most, uh, the newest group, if you want, and those are the patients who uh, have suffered with or, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, rather, and their inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, has gone into remission, but it's left them with the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome. Now, as I'm gonna talk a little bit about tonight, um, there are triggers that can make these symptoms worse, and certainly stress uh, is uh, one of those, and food is another one. Uh, they're not the cause of irritable bowel syndrome, but they certainly can make symptoms worse. So what are the symptoms? Well, they're showing uh, uh, quite nicely on this slide, and up in the uh, uh, left-hand corner on your screen, of course, we have diarrhea, which is uh, one of the uh, signature symptoms of uh, diarrhea-predominant irritable bowel syndrome. And then the other, of course, is abdominal pain. And uh, these two uh, cardinal symptoms can be associated with other symptoms. So you can experience urgency before a bowel movement. You may have a bowel movement and then 
experience incomplete emptying of the bowel. Unfortunately, uh, it sometimes can lead to loss of bowel control and uh, which uh, obviously can be um, very, quite embarrassing. And then um, it also can be associated uh, for about a third of patients with what we call upper gut or foregut symptoms. So patients with abdominal pain and diarrhea may also experience nausea, heartburn, and belching, for example. So what are the causes? Well, this is something that we've certainly struggled with for a long time, and we're beginning to get some pieces to the puzzle. So one of the pieces is that there's a conversation going on in our bodies constantly between our gut and our, and our brain, and then from our brain back to our gut. And in some of us, this uh, conversation can uh, become dysregulated and contribute to symptoms. One of the hottest topics right now is the, the concept of the microbiome in the gut. And this can be um, uh, abnormal, uh, for example, after a bacterial infection, or if you were to receive antibiotics, or for other reasons that we now uh, don't fully appreciate. As I mentioned, stress anxiety can be a trigger. It's not a cause, but it certainly can aggravate the symptoms. And for some patients, it's a very dominant feature of their um, symptom profile. We become more and more interested in bile acids because the uh, liver is constantly secreting bile into our small intestine to help us to absorb our nutrients. Now, normally, these bile acids are reabsorbed in the small bowel, and they never get down into the lower bowel. But we're realizing now that some patients have an abnormal amount of bile acids that are, are uh, down in their lower bowel rather than getting reabsorbed. And when they're down there, they can trigger the symptoms of diarrhea. Uh, so uh, that's another treatment area that we'll be talking about. Food sensitivity is another uh, big topic, and I'll be coming back to that in a little more detail in a few minutes. Genetics and, uh, is another area of interest. Uh, we are suspicious of that there are some family groupings with irritable bowel syndrome, but we really haven't identified any specific uh, genetic factors to date but certainly an area of, of active interest. And then as I mentioned, uh, antibiotics uh, can actually trigger the irritable bowel syndrome in some patients. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that uh, conundrum in a moment. So let's move on to this notion of the, the gut and the brain communication. And this is not a, a one-way street. This is constantly going uh, to the brain and back again. And this uh, leads to, uh, can lead to an amplification of symptoms. And in some patients, it's uh, sort of a top-down um, uh, signaling, and others, it's a bottom-up signaling. But at the end of the day, it's all of these factors that are constantly in motion in our bodies and signaling back and forth that can leave, uh, lead to the symptoms that we're experiencing. So the areas that are particularly of interest, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about tonight, is uh, the most recent focus has been on what's been going on in the lumen of our gut and how could this be generating symptoms. So let's talk about that a little bit more in detail. For those of you who've had a colonoscopy or know of someone who's had a colonoscopy with irritable bowel syndrome, you'll know that the doctors uh, have told you that the lining of your bowel looks completely normal. And this is a picture through a colonoscope of the normal uh, bowel. And you can see um, the nice shiny uh, lining, which we call the mucosa, and you can see the blood vessels nice and clearly. Now, 
if we take a little biopsy, and fortunately we don't have any sensory fibers right in this uh, superficial lining, so we can do this without causing discomfort, and we take that biopsy and we send it off to a pathologist, he'll send a report back and he'll say it's completely normal with standard staining. But one of the big discoveries about 10 years ago was in fact those biopsies are not normal. And when uh, investigators looked for subtle signs of uh, inflammatory mediators, they found that indeed they were elevated in patients, or at least a subset of patients with irritable bowel syndrome. So this uh, on the left here shows histamine. And these uh, uh, gray uh, diamonds are from what are called healthy controls, patients that went under a colonoscopy probably for screening for colon cancer, but didn't have any symptoms. And you can see that in the IBS patients, this was markedly elevated. And similarly, another inflammatory uh, mediator called tryptase was also increased in the IBS patients compared to the healthy controls. Now, this is relevant because these inflammatory mediators are found in mast cells. And this is a picture, well, actually an electron micrograph, micrograph of the intestine showing a mast cell, a very high resolution. You can actually make out the granules and they contain the histamine and the tryptase. But what's really interesting what these arrows are showing it's right up against a nerve and when this histamine and tryptase is released from the mast cells it sensitizes these nerves and they send exaggerated pain signals to the brain now of course we've been very interested to know well if these if there are abnormal and low levels of inflammatory mediators, what could be the triggers that are causing this? And this most recently has led to a lot of focus on what's going on in the lumen of the bowel. So let me just orient you on this slide. This is that lining that I showed you. These are, this is the mucosa. And this is the lumen inside of your bowel. Of course, that's where the food goes, that's where the microbiota are, and that's where those bile acids are that I mentioned. They're signaling to this lining, and underneath this lining, we find the nerves that, and immune cells. And these immune cells can get activated, sensitize the nerves, and then this sends the exaggerated pain signals to the brain. Food is of particular interest because it interacts with the microbiome. And one of the things that happens is that many foods that we eat can be fermented by the bacteria and they produce uh, fluid in the bowel and also gas and possibly other factors then that can signal into the wall of the intestine. And I'll just spend a little bit of time talking about this a group of foods called FODMAPs. This is an acronym for fermentable oligodyed monosaccharides and polyols. And that's sort of a fancy name for carbohydrates or sugars that are in healthy foods that we eat that we didn't realize weren't being digested very well. And so they sneak through the small intestine and they get down into the lower bowel where the bacteria are, and these bacteria then uh, ferment these uh, sugars and produce this uh, fluid and gas and probably other metabolites that then signal to those nerves that I mentioned. And we know that um, this can cause uh, distension of the bowel and if you have a hypersensitive gut, which many IBS patients do, and then it gets distended by the act of eating, this can trigger symptoms. And then we're also starting to get some evidence that diet may actually be one of the triggers itself to um, promote and activate this uh, immune system that's sensitizing the nerves.
this is a, uh, a slide showing the lining of the bowel here again the mucosa so this is the lumen where the food and the bacteria lie and this is the outside wall and the purpose of this is to show you these round circles that are um, organized in what we call ganglia because these are nerves that live in the intestine and I suspect it will be surprising to most of you to know that there are actually more nerves in the intestine than there are in your spinal cord. This is a very complex nervous system. And you can imagine then that when these nerves get sensitized that signal to the brain pain, but also are involved in organizing the propulsion in your gut and the secretion in your gut, that these uh, can have profound effects on changing the normal uh, organization and uh, activity of your bowel and lead to the gut either going too fast or going too slow. So let's talk now a little bit about diagnosis. Here we want to take a careful medical history and do a careful physical examination. We will need to do some tests, but I want to emphasize that we don't need to do a lot of tests. And then uh, part of this careful history, we'll be talking and, and inquiring about your family history. So this is a, a lovely picture of the uh, Colosseum in Rome. And the relevance of this is that many of you may know of the term called the Rome criteria, which uh, are formally used to diagnose uh, irritable bowel syndrome. Now we use these mainly for clinical studies, but uh, in essence, it uh, describes abdominal pain associated with bowel, altered bowel pattern, either constipation or diarrhea or alternating back and forth between the two. We also wanna look for what we call red flags. And these red flags are rectal bleeding, now, it's not that uncommon if you suffer from constipation to occasionally notice some little streaks of blood on the tissue paper or the outside of the stool, typical of bleeding hemorrhoids. So this isn't always a red flag, but it's certainly something that a physician needs to review and make a decision uh, on what the possibility, possible cause could be. Anemia. Uh, is not a feature of the irritable bowel syndrome and, and physicians need to look for another cause for this. Irritable bowel syndrome can uh, start at any age in life, but it typically involves younger people. And so uh, when it onsets after the age of 50, uh, our antennae go up a little bit because this is also the age group where colon cancer becomes uh, more of an issue. Uh, so this might prompt uh, physicians to do some additional testing. Irritable bowel syndrome doesn't typically wake us from our sleep at night. It can in, in a few cases, but that's an exception. And so typically that will prompt the physician to want to do some additional testing. Weight loss is also not a feature of the irritable bowel syndrome. And finally, if you have a strong family history of inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, or celiac disease, or colon cancer, this may prompt your physician to want to do some additional testing. So again, uh, careful in his history and physical are probably the most important, checking for these red flags and in a few tests. And this can enable us to make a positive diagnosis. And I want to emphasize this point because uh, physicians do not uh, any longer treat the irritable bowel syndrome as a diagnosis of exclusion. Now these uh, simple tests typically involve checking your blood, so that's uh, what's called a CBC. We may also do a blood test to look for an inflammatory marker such as, which is called CRP. We probably would ask for a stool culture to check for infection, and if you've had it uh, uh, for a year or so, we might wanna look for parasites as well. For diarrhea predominant irritable bowel syndrome, uh, we typically check uh, 
with a blood test for celiac disease because celiac disease we know affects about one in a hundred North Americans and so uh, it, it makes good sense uh, to check for this. The uh, blood test is very accurate. And then finally, if, uh, if you're over the age of 40 years of age, and this is a new onset of uh, diarrhea, we probably would want to get some biopsies uh, using a technique similar to what I showed you in the previous uh, few slides back to check for a benign condition called microscopic colitis. Uh, which is treatable, and, and hence uh, we wouldn't want to, uh, to miss that. So what about colonoscopy? Well, I, I've mentioned a few indications for that, but typically we reserve colonoscopy and other more detailed testing if there's red flags or new onset of symptoms uh, over the age of 50. An area of controversy that I want to spend a few minutes uh, on is this notion of breath testing. And this, this uh, has evolved because uh, there's a, a group of investigators who've suggested that there's an overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine that explains why a large proportion of patients with irritable bowel syndrome have symptoms. And you may have heard of the acronym SIBO small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Well, this whole concept evolved from uh, using a breath test, and, and many uh, healthcare providers in the community are still advocating for this. And I, I want to explain to you why this test is not helpful. Let me walk you through this. This, this is a picture of our intestine, and so we would ingest a sugar called lactulose. This is a non-absorbable sugar, and because of that, it travels right through the small intestine because it's not absorbed, and then when it reaches the colon, these bacteria ferment this sugar. It's in essence one of these FODMAPs I talked to you about. And when it gets fermented, we rapidly absorb the hydrogen gas into the blood supply, and it goes to the lungs, and we can collect it in inspired uh, gas. And then we can put, uh, put this on a machine and we can measure the amount of hydrogen that's uh, in parts per million that's in the collection. So this is time. So we've swallowed the lactulose and we take repeated samples and it takes time for this lactulose to get to the colon. So we see there's just a flat line here. But then when it reaches these bacteria, we get this increase in lactulose, or sorry, in, in hydrogen that reflects the lactulose being fermented. Now the notion is that these bacteria, for reasons that wouldn't be clear, have migrated up into the small intestine. And that's the concept behind SIBO. And if that were the case, what these investigators proposed was the breath test would increase sooner because the time to get there would be sooner, and you'd get an earlier peak in this hydrogen production. Let me show you uh, the studies that this was based upon. So here's one of the original studies, and the red bar shows the patients with irritable bowel syndrome that had a positive test. And you can see it was a large proportion, over 80%, quite dramatic. And this is, these are the individuals who don't have IBS symptoms. And there weren't very many of them in this study, but almost none of them had a positive test. So it, it was quite a dramatic finding. And this led to the notion, well, we should probably be treating these people with antibiotics because they have this overgrowth of bacteria. We and others were skeptical about this, so we did a similar study in our patient population. This is our study here. This is a study in Sweden, and this is a study in the US. Now we, using the same criteria that they used, indeed found that IBS patients had a positive breath test. The problem was that when we looked in the healthy controls, patients with no symptoms, they also had a positive test. 
So this test, unfortunately, does not discriminate between patients with irritable bowel syndrome and healthy individuals. So it's very misleading, and we really discourage the use of this test. So let's move on and talk about uh, the treatment of irritable bowel syndrome. As I mentioned earlier on, uh, fortunately, there are a number of different options that are emerging that seem to work, at least for a subset of patients. So diet therapies have become uh, um, very uh, popular for some patients and physicians are uh, not infrequently recommending them. Probably the most studied and widely used diet is the FODMAP diet that I referred to earlier. And remember these FODMAPs are found in healthy foods and they can uh, lead to fermentation and the generation of symptoms. So these diets are um, low in, in, we put patients on a diet with foods that are low in FODMAPs to reduce the symptoms. And the Canadian Digestive uh, Health Foundation website is one of the best places where you can find information uh, about this diet. Lifestyle is important. Obviously living, living a healthy lifestyle, uh, getting adequate sleep and exercise and, and eating regularly and uh, a well-balanced diet um, is important for uh, all medical conditions. Medication, uh, <clears throat> there are a number of options and we'll talk about those in a minute, either over the counter or prescribed. So I mentioned the diet therapies. Uh, what about probiotics? Uh, there are all kinds of choices uh, to choose from and a lot of confusion in this area. The feeling amongst, I think, most uh, clinician scientists uh, in this area is that there is a role for probiotics, but it's not a big role. It, if, the, if the benefits are there, they're relatively modest, and the group of patients that are most likely to benefit are those with diarrhea predominant irritable bowel syndrome. The problem is we there are so many different products out there and they're not well regulated like medications are. So what's um, proposed uh, on the packaging to be in the probiotics may not exactly be what's there. And we don't know whether the probiotics are alive or dead in the preparation. So there's a lot of unknowns with probiotics. We've used tricyclic antidepressants for many years and found it to be very found them to be very effective in many patients. These are not in, do in doses that have any antidepressant action, and we're not prescribing them for patients for their potential uh, mood effects. We're prescribing them because they're known to regulate uh, pain signaling from the gut. And they also have a bit of a constipating effect, which is beneficial if you're suffering from diarrhea. Now they do have a sedative action, and so we recommend low doses of them taken at bedtime. A product that's been around for a long time, but uh, now is emerging again as a treatment is peppermint oil. And peppermint oil um, can have benefits both on discomfort and on diarrhea and altering bowel pattern. Uh, more recent products um, have the peppermint oil encapsulated so it doesn't get released in the stomach it gets released lower down in the gut, and that's uh, mitigated a, a lot of the negative side effects people experienced before with uh, the uh, heartburn that they're experiencing, for example. Antibiotics are, uh, as I've mentioned already and alluded to, uh, controversial. Uh, they are uh, certainly uh, used uh, fairly widely in the United States. Um, I think we've embraced them less in Canada, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. I also mentioned about bile acids and uh, the fact that they can, uh, in increased uh, concentrations, uh, get um, <clears throat> into the lower bowel and cause diarrhea. And hence, uh, if we use a bile acid binder like cholestyramine, which is a powder you mix up in a drink, this can be beneficial for some patients. Uh, 
We find this particularly helpful in patients who previously had their gallbladder out. Imodium uh, is a um, uh, peripherally acting uh, opioid uh, agonist that suppresses gut function, secretion, and motility. And it's very effective, but we don't typically recommend it in irritable bowel syndrome on a continued basis, but certainly it's useful if you're going out for a special occasion, for example, or you're traveling and you don't want to be caught out uh, away from a washroom. The newest uh, medication that's come on the market in Canada uh, and in North America is uh, this product called Elux Adeline. And this is uh, an interesting medication that works uh, only peripherally in the gut. It's uh, an agonist at uh, mu opioid and, uh, receptors and uh, an antagonist at other opioid receptors called uh, delta receptors. And this drug has been shown in well-designed clinical studies uh, to decrease uh, diarrhea and also decrease abdominal pain. And uh, this, uh, although we don't have a lot of experience with this medication, uh, seems like it could be a useful option for some patients, particularly if you've tried other things that have not been helpful. We uh, have to be a little bit careful with this medication because although the events seem to be rare, there have been a few described events of pancreatitis. And so uh, we're careful um, not to use this drug in patients who've had previous pancreatitis uh, or have had their gallbladder out in the past. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, behavioral uh, therapies as well, because for some patients, um, even though, again, stress is uh, and anxiety are not the causes, they can be important triggers. And many patients have found uh, these therapies, either through cognitive behavioral therapy or what's called gut-directed hypnotherapy, to be helpful. And, and certainly, um, if uh, your symptoms um, are really troubling you and some of these other options are not working for you, you want to at least give this consideration. So I'm going to just end with a few uh, comments again about antibiotics because Many of us have concerns about using antibiotics widely to treat irritable bowel syndrome. The, uh, these antibiotics are causing dramatic changes in your microbiome, and we don't know what the long-term consequences of that would be. And there really are a number of considerations. So first of all, we don't really know what we're treating. There are some well-designed clinical trials that have shown that uh, antibiotics, in particular a medication called rifaximin, can uh, reduce bloating. Um, the benefit is about 10% over placebo. The proponents uh, of using this medication want us to believe that it's uh, treating SIBO, this overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine. But I, I hopefully I've convinced you that Currently, there's no evidence for this, and we don't have a test to diagnose it. And uh, it's possible that there might be a minor disturbance in the, small, in the bacteria in our small intestine, but there are huge numbers of bacteria in the colon compared to the small intestine. So if you think about taking a broad-acting antibiotic, the predominant effect is going to be on this large microbiome that we have in the colon. So we don't really know, again, what the impact is. The other thing these studies have shown, if you go on antibiotics, that once you stop them, your symptoms are likely to gonna come back again. So then what's the option? Go back on antibiotics again for a longer period of time? There's a broader issue here too uh, that physicians uh, need to be worried about, but also the public at large because if we take uh, antibiotics and use them indiscriminately and widely across our population, then out of that can emerge micro, uh, 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 bacteria that become resistant to our antibiotics.
And this is already a concern for joint replacements because the major infection is only uh, uh, responsive to uh, antibiotic called rifamycin and the this antibiotic cross reacts with that so if it made that uh, infection in joint replacements resistant to any antibiotic treatment we'd really be in trouble and the final thing is that these antibiotics are very expensive and so if you were to go on these on a long-term basis there would be considerable costs so this is my last slide, and I'll just uh, summarize with these take-home messages. As uh, you heard from Jeff, uh, irritable bowel syndrome and, and diarrhea predominant irritable bowel syndrome is very common, and it can significantly impact on your quality of life. The good news is that uh, there's increasing understanding of the causes. Uh, there's much to be learned, but uh, we're already seeing um, uh, new therapies emerging that we didn't have even five or ten years ago. And we can diagnose irritable bowel syndrome with confidence based on a careful history and physical, and in most cases, a few simple tests. And we really uh, want to avoid uh, doing more and more tests because we know from clinical experience that they're, they're not going to help us. And, and uh, in many cases, they can be harmful. And then finally, um, it's, it is an exciting new area. We have uh, a, a number of different effective therapies for many patients. They don't work for everyone. Um, and um, we're hopeful that uh, over the next uh, number of years, even more treatments are gonna come forward. So thank you very much for your attention and I'd certainly be happy to entertain some questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Manner. Uh, we do have some questions, and uh, I'll try to get to as many of them as we can in, uh, in probably about the next 10 minutes we have um, left. So one of the questions that we've got is, um, thanks for talking about the breath test. There has been a lot of advertising on Facebook of a breath analysis device that I was considering purchasing. So it is good to know I'd be wasting my money. <laughs> it's not, not really a question, but I think uh, it's um, something that Dr. Vanner has uh, expressed uh, enough knowledge to us about tonight. Um, one of the other questions we've got is, um, can you have IBSD and IBSC at the same time? So that's, that's an important question, Jeff. The irritable bowel syndrome is uh, an interesting uh, disorder in that regard because some patients in the space of a week will experience diarrhea for half the week and constipation for the other half of the week. The other thing, and we don't understand the reasons for this, is that some patients may suffer from diarrhea predominant irritable bowel syndrome for a number of years, only to find that some trigger suddenly happens and they switch over and now they suffer from constipation predominant irritable bowel syndrome. So the face of this can change on short intervals and longer intervals for reasons that we don't understand, but it's certainly a common feature of the irritable bowel syndrome. Okay. Um, can you please comment about gluten and IBS? Uh, the FODMAP diet is low absent in gluten. Do you agree this is useful as gluten is not a FODMAP? So uh, thank you. That's a, an interesting question and certainly uh, one that's um, uh, challenged uh, clinicians as well. The, the history behind this is actually that before we knew about FODMAPs, we knew that patients were benefiting, at least some patients, from a, from a gluten-free or at least a gluten-reduced diet. And there were clinical trials showing that um, if you put patients who um, had, had experienced improvement with a gluten-free diet uh, 
back on gluten that their symptoms all came back again. Um, and so we, we knew that gluten could trigger, trigger symptoms. What we subsequently learned, however, is that when you reduce gluten, you reduce FODMAPs. And clinical studies now are suggesting that at least for the large proportion of patients who, who've uh, experienced a benefit with a gluten-free diet, that it's likely that it's the reduction of the FODMAPs, not the gluten, that's um, responsible for the improvement. Now that said, there are other factors uh, in a gluten-free diet other than gluten and FODMAPs that um, could also uh, be playing a role, and that's, that's an area of active investigation right now. Okay, is um, IBS a risk factor for other serious diseases? That's another uh, very important question, and the, the answer to that is absolutely not. Um, as I alluded to earlier, we, we've known about the irritable bowel syndrome for over 150 years, and so we know a lot about the natural history. And although this disorder can wax and wane itself in its, in its severity and its, in its expression, it is not um, a risk factor for any known uh, disorder. Okay, um, is, and this, you probably just answered this question actually uh, uh, by what you just said, but is IBS a forever condition? So the, the answer to that is, is, a, is no. Um, what we don't know is um, whether, uh, in, in whom it's going to, uh, persist for long periods of time and for others where it will um, sort of fizzle out if you want. We, we do know that, that many patients who start with an infectious diarrhea as the trigger for this, their symptoms tend to wax and wane but usually diminish over years. And, but for other patients, it's really unpredictable. So it's, it's hard to give people an answer about that. Um, and um, sometimes we, we just have to wait and see. Okay. Um, I'm a little confused about SIBO. Are you saying it does not exist? If it does, Hang on, sorry. Uh, if it does, what is the relationship to IBS and how to treat it? So uh, what I'm saying about SIBO is that we know that SIBO does exist, uh, it, but it exists in conditions where there are clear abnormalities in the, in the bowel. For example, some patients have had major surgery and the bowel doesn't work well any longer. And so there's areas of the gut where it's essentially sort of stagnant, nothing's moving, and that allows the bacteria to grow up. And, and we know that that causes symptoms. But when it does that, it, it causes, a, causes a host of, of abnormalities that we can detect through blood tests. So that's sort of classic SIBO. What's new and different here is that although IBS can be very distressing and uncomfortable, it, patients are otherwise well. And this is an interesting hypothesis, but there's no evidence for it right now. They're just, and the breath test is completely misleading. Could there be subtle differences in the smaller numbers of bacteria that exist in the small intestine? and that these could be leading to symptoms? For example, uh, could there be a few more fermenters in the small intestine in one individual than another? That's certainly that's possible. But most of the fermenters are in the colon. So what I'm trying to emphasize is, for example, with a treatment like antibiotics, the dominant effect is gonna be in the colon, not in the small intestine. So there's very little evidence that SIBO, there isn't any evidence that SIBO exists in the classical sense in IBS. There's a hypothesis, a suggestion, 
that there might be disturbances uh, of, in small numbers in IBS, but again, there's no evidence for that. What there is evidence for is that the bacteria in the colon are not the same as people who don't have IBS symptoms and that this could be amplifying symptoms. So this is an ongoing area of uh, research, but unfortunately with regards to SIBO and IBS, the treatments have gotten out ahead of any scientific evidence to support this. And I think we need to be very cautious going forward uh, to know what we're treating and to use safe and effective long-term therapies. Okay, I'm going to uh, combine a couple of questions here. It makes kind of sense. Um, can probiotics help me feel better? And if so, is it advisable to start a probiotic during a flare-up of IBS or wait until symptoms settle down? So that, thank you for that question. It's, it's a tough one. Um, and, and part of what makes it tough is that there are some studies suggesting benefit. There are other studies suggesting there isn't a benefit. And all of these products have different uh, bacteria in them. So it's very hard to, comp to sort of build up a story uh, of, of benefit. And, and as I summarized earlier, we, we think that um, some of these uh, bacteria, bifidobacter, for example, um, may be beneficial, but it doesn't seem to have a, a huge effect for most patients. So it may give some benefit, but it's usually not a really dramatic benefit, particularly if your symptoms are really troubling. So I, I would not discourage you from trying it, but like all things, there, there's an expense to it. Some of them are very expensive. And uh, we just don't really know enough to really make um, solid recommendations around this. Your question about feeling better, um, in addition, uh, I, I, I'll take that as beyond your sort of gut IBS symptoms is a very interesting one. And I'll, I'll just mention a very uh, provocative study uh, from the McMaster group where they showed that um, if you took um, a probiotic called Bifidobacter longum, um, that your mood improved compared to patients who got the placebo uh, probiotic. Now this is a very preliminary study and there's gonna be a large multi-center study to confirm these findings, but it is intriguing. Um, and, and I think it just highlights how much more uh, we have to learn about the microbiome. Um, okay, the, um, a couple of more questions here. Uh, we are uh, past our time actually, um, but we've been getting a lot of interactivity here. So I, I think it's important that we try to address as many as possible. Um, are you aware of IBSD cases that require more aggressive nutritional support if there is evidence of chronic malnutrition and weight loss? So the, answer, the short answer to that is no. And the reason for that is that if you uh, have malnutrition and you're not absorbing your nutrients, that by definition, uh, you're not suffering from the irritable bowel syndrome and there's some other disorder at hand. The, um, I think the challenge here is that um, you want to make sure that the diagnosis of malabsorption and nutrient deficiencies is, is made appropriately um, because sometimes uh, that uh, diagnosis is made um, without doing uh, appropriate testing. And it's not indicated in most patients with irritable bowel syndrome, but if there are signs and symptoms that lead in that direction, then uh, certainly appropriate testing should be done. And if the testing's abnormal, then it's not irritable bowel syndrome. Okay, and if uh, Crohn's and ulcerated colitis, uh, 
types of IBD are ruled out in the way of diagnosis, does this leave only a possible diagnosis of IBS? Uh, well, the answer to that is no. Um, and, you know, it, it's a little hard to answer because it, we need to do it in the context of individual patients. But there are other conditions that, uh, that can mimic the irritable bowel syndrome, but again, they're, they have to be taken in the right context. So if you're a young individual um, with uh, the, the features of the irritable bowel syndrome and the absence of any red flags, and there's nothing in your history and physical suggest inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease has been excluded, then we can make a positive diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome. As we get older in life, I mentioned that uh, microscopic uh, colitis um, needs to be excluded. As we get older again, um, we need to worry about the, the possibility of colon cancer, especially if you're old, over the age of 50 with new onset symptoms. But um, and, and then, of course, there are other things that would come out in a careful history and physical, such as, you know, were you taking a new medication that could have triggered symptoms? Or did you just have your gallbladder out? Or, um, you know, other, other features that would lead, um, uh, lead a physician to suspect other things. So this, this all comes out in a careful history and physical, but this, this is the backbone of making the diagnosis, not doing a lot of additional testing. Okay, our, our last question of the evening actually is, um, depending on the therapy that I get prescribed for my IBS, how long do you, will, you, will it take for me to see improvements? That's, that's a great question. Uh, and it, the answer is that it varies. So, uh, with some, some treatments, um, you should see benefit within, within a week or two. And some of the newer medications um, might take longer than that, particularly those that um, have uh, a benefit uh, with regards to modifying pain. And in, in some of those, uh, they might take um, um, a week or sorry, a month or, or even a bit longer than that before you'd see the benefit. So, as long as you're not experiencing uh, side effects from the medication, and, and most of them are well tolerated, then you probably should uh, try them at least for a month uh, before um, uh, giving up on them. Okay. Well, I want to uh, give you give thanks to uh, Dr. Vander for uh, spending the evening with us tonight, um, and. What we will try to do is uh, follow up on our website, obviously with the, uh, the recorded version of, of this uh, program for anyone that would like to uh, revisit it or uh, tell any, uh, uh, any individuals that you feel would be uh, benefit from uh, seeing uh, the recorded version of, of the program. And for those questions that we didn't get, to um, I will do my best to uh, get some answers to them and we'll also post those on the website as well. So uh, once again everyone uh, uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Vanner and uh, everyone have a, a good evening.